Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. We always wondered why my uh, great-grandfather left New Orleans. Uncovering secrets of Louisiana's domestic slave trade. The basics are simple. You need a fast horse. How horse breeding is booming in Louisiana. We had to make the United States more perfect under the Constitution. A civil rights hero and how a Baton Rouge church led change. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. We want to welcome you to this special edition of SWI at the midway point of 2018. For this broadcast, we've selected four stories we feel are uniquely Louisiana. The stories we've chosen come with a myriad of emotions. Some force us to take a hard look at ourselves, while others reveal unexplored aspects of our culture. We hope you'll enjoy them as much as we did. From high school American history, we know James Madison was the fourth president of the United States. Something perhaps lesser known is that Madison owned about 100 slaves on his plantation, Montpelier, in Northern Virginia. When he fell on hard times, he sold 16 of those slaves to a wealthy cousin who owned a plantation in Louisiana. Now research is uncovering generations of their descendants. This antebellum home and the land surrounding it holds secrets. It's located on Bayou Latin Ash near the community of Bachelor in Point Capi Parish. In 1834, James Madison sold 16 of his slaves to his distant cousin, William Taylor. Genealogist and historian Zan Nelson is working to uncover some of those secrets. William Taylor at that time had two plantations in Louisiana. The William Taylor home, then known as the Briars, is one of those two plantations. But information about those 16 enslaved sold here from Virginia is almost non-existent. Nelson calls them the Louisiana 16. We knew the name of one of the enslaved, a first name, her name was Betty. She was mentioned in a letter uh, from William Taylor to Madison. But one name. Yeah, that's what and we And just a first name. Yes. Also. N no ages, no genders, uh, no other data. Oh, we're standing here going, ooh, tell and us you're about But it, right? I think that's part of the story, <laughs> is that, you know, you all, through some of the work I've done and connecting with work that you all have done, we're all coming together and learning more about each other. Les Ann and Drew Grzafi now own the Taylor Plantation. Nelson believes it's where ancestors of Reverend Fagan Davis Jr. were once enslaved. Davis pastors this small church down the road. We always wondered why my uh, great grandfather left New Orleans, who, and where he was trained in the ministry in the Catholic Church, to come back here. We couldn't figure out why. Reverend Davis's great grandfather, Ed Ward Davis, founded the church in 1890. This is uh, the bill of sale for this property here at Little Zion. Edward Davis is buried alongside his wife in a small cemetery next to the church. Reverend Davis had always known this, but he never knew what came before him until last year. It just so happens clues to that connection came when his cousin heard a podcast that featured Nelson and her research. We were talking about some of these ancestors that I did find here, and particularly a woman by the name of Jenny Cook and her twin daughters, Lucy and Lucinda Cook, who we have record of their birth and their baptism. 
We got a call in during that show from a gentleman in New Orleans, and it's a live show, and he said, you're talking about my ancestors. Nelson says Jenny Cook was not one of the 16, but was a housemate to William Taylor's wife. She believes Cook and her daughter Lucinda were the grandmother and mother of Edward Davis. How is it to learn about the past of your family that brings you to the present and maybe ties up loose ends that you, you didn't know about before? Every family has their own uh, history. And when we look at what Zan is doing and what we already knew, this history brings to light how our people, and my family in particular, persevered. The man was uh, astonishing in this community, and, and that shows you how no matter what you go up with or what you dealt with, if you're sincere and if you persevere, you can accomplish a lot. And uh, I think he was able to do that, and his descendants are really blessed because of that. Nelson's blog, historyinvestigator.net, is where she chronicles her journey. She explains how networking, speaking at churches, and digging through records can help reveal some answers. She read a diary kept by William Taylor and says it had a wealth of information. Then you have to get out and you walk. You walk and find cemeteries. You walk and understand communities and their relationships physically to the plantations. So it's all part of the puzzle. There's a connection with the Taylor Plantation and this church. I feel certain when we start looking at title searches and looking at when they bought this land that it had been previously part of the Taylor Plantation. What's important about bringing the past to the present and what does it do for these families? Moving from Virginia to Louisiana was like going to the moon. There's no thought of ever getting back, not in 1834. They were leaving behind family. Yeah. Parents, grandparents, younger siblings, older siblings. Torn from family. Yes. I don't think there's any ethnic group in the United States of America, maybe anywhere in the world, that can go from being uh, the most brutal form of slavery, endure it, persevere, and the generations after them were able to survive and, and prosper in the same nation. Now we can reach out and maybe go from there to reach out beyond Edward Davis and find out where our family and our relatives and our heritage lead us to. Zan Nelson continues her work connecting families to the Louisiana 16. You can follow her blog at historyinvestigator.net. It's been called the Mother Church, and like a mother leads her children, Mount Zion First Baptist Church in Baton Rouge has been called upon to lead throughout its history. We were there as the church celebrated its 160th anniversary this year. 160 years with one organization, let alone being a church is phenomenal. Sandra Temple Hall has been a member of Mount Zion since 1987. She calls it home. If home is a refuge, then Mount Zion has surely been that. The idea of the church was born in 1858 from two ministers, one black, one white. Eight others joined that first flock. Records show, 11 years later, this purchase of land for $275. The contract describes where the church was to be built, it being a corner lot and measures 64 feet front on East Boulevard Street and 128 along Spain Street, State of Louisiana, parish of East Baton Rouge. I can just imagine the days when uh, the church was started. It was, I'm sure, a little wooden building and the slaves or the former slaves were getting together to be together and to share the word of the Lord and studying and singing and that one opportunity per week for them to be together and to praise God would have been wonderful. 
There also had to be a wonderful sense of unity that was happening that kept those early church members coming back and that brought in more and more new members. The vision of those early church leaders is a vision that continues to this day. This 1885 official map of Baton Rouge shows colored churches of the area. On the corner of East and Spain is Mount Zion. By 1896, Mount Zion had a new church building. It's hard to even fathom that this church rose to the level it rose, through what it rose, you know, through the opposition it rose through. Dr. Rene Brown has pastored Mount Zion for 10 years. His calling to the pulpit is one he battled. He grew up in Northeast Louisiana Delta country and farming was in his blood. But as he says, God had other plans for him. Just as in 1949, when the church found itself under the leadership of a new charismatic visionary, Reverend T.J. Jemison. The 1940s had seen the expanding church broadcast services on local radio, and the church was a light of hope, not just for the city, but the entire state. The then new Reverend Jemison was about to take Mount Zion to a whole new level. Because he made the church a national church. He made it a national church. A beacon of light. Uh, yes, he made it a beacon of light. He made it that pillar in the community. I mean, he, it was the epitome of other churches. People came here to see what he had done to then go back and do it in other places. Reverend Jemison was about breaking down unfair and cruel barriers. And in 1953, the preaching civil rights pioneer organized the Baton Rouge bus boycott. It was the first large-scale stand by African Americans against a southern city's segregated bus system. Johnny Jones, now 98, was the young lawyer Reverend Jemison asked to handle the landmark effort. Even though Jones was just 15 days out of Southern Law School, he believed their case would prevail because he trusted in the law of the land. We had to make the United States more perfect under the Constitution. And that's what I was trying to do. In the course of two weeks, the Baton Rouge City Council passed an ordinance that reformed the bus company's segregationist seating policy. It served as a blueprint for the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott and Rosa Parks two years later. Throughout his life, Jones endured indignities. He faced threats from the Ku Klux Klan. A cop beat him during a traffic stop because of the color of his skin. But he pressed on and endured, and the body that made up Mount Zion had his back. I was looking at the present and predicting what today might be. I was always interested in what changes could be made and what, change, what, what role I should play. In 1954, Mount Zion moved into its present-day church building, which was a first of its kind in Baton Rouge. The architect, local and national legend, A. Hayes Town. Hall believes what's special about Mount Zion is that its heart has never skipped a beat. You just don't see people and groups of people being together and staying together that long. There's always somebody who wants to do something different or go someplace else, but for them to continue to share their lives was wonderful. What Jones takes heart in shows who he is and what he has seen in his nearly 100 years. What I appreciate most about life, I can walk the street today without, without, without being called a derogatory name. The only time I was practicing law, my name wasn't Johnny. Somebody would say that goes the end lawyer. Reverend Brown believes this 160th milestone is coming at an important time in history for the church. You cannot be so focused on your history that you fail to recognize the need to exist in the future. And if you leave these generations to themselves that are out here right now, you won't have a church nor will you have these generations. So how do, you, how do you do that? You take the best from the past, bring it to the present with a view toward the future.
Well, Louisiana sports fans love to talk about their team's success stories, so we were surprised to learn earlier this year about a sport that Cajuns in particular excel at but haven't gotten a lot of attention for, horse racing. Kelly worked on this story. That's right, and it's not just jockeys that are world-renowned. Horse breeding business is a billion-dollar-a-year industry and generates millions in taxes and employs thousands of workers. That's part of the beauty of the, of the business and the industry is that there are so, so many variables and, and it's really pretty complex. The basics are simple. You need a fast horse. Val Morel calls horse racing a thinking man's game. There are stats to analyze, pedigrees to examine, odds to consider. Morel and his family run the state's premier thoroughbred farm, Clear Creek Stud in Folsom, Louisiana. You never know where a runner's going to come from. There's numbers, and I don't like to say it's luck. And when everything comes together in some, in some situations, the individual's successful and they haven't spent a gazillion dollars to get there, but they made it. If you're new to horse racing, you might need a translator to help you out. Warren Harang is a man who knows. He is president of the Louisiana Thoroughbred Breeders Association. There are at least six different words for what a layperson might refer to as a horse. When a boy horse is born, it's called a colt until it's five years old. Then it's a horse. When it's retired to breeding, then it's a stallion. A female is a filly until she's five years old. That's considered a mare after five. And on the racetrack, she's identified as a filly until she's five. And then normally when you breed a mare or a female, she becomes a brood mare when she's in foal. You might know what a horseshoe is, but have you ever heard of a farrier? Farrier is a, is a person who is uh, very talented and he trims horses' feet and he, and he shoes horses. And that is a, that is a great art because there are no two horses the same. And last time I checked, there are four feet on each horse. And very seldom do you have two of the same on all four feet. So they have to look at that, evaluate, and trim and shoe accordingly. It's a completely different language in the horse business, just like it is in the oil and gas business or probably the sugar cane business or anything else you want to get involved in that, that you and I are not familiar with on a daily basis. Tom Early is retired from a 38-year career with the association. Another word to know, paramutual. Paramutual track is, a, is a basically a track where people are actually betting against each other. Uh, and and in, it, the simplest way to describe it is all of the money bet on the losers is divided up among the winners. So that you're really not betting against a track, you're betting against your, uh, your fellow bettors. There are four paramutual racetracks in Louisiana. The Fairgrounds in New Orleans. Delta Downs in Vinton, uh, Louisiana Downs in Shreveport, and Evangeline. On racing days, there's at least three Louisiana-bred races offered. Your horse has to be born fouled in Louisiana, and the mare, the mama horse, has to live in Louisiana and can only be bred with an out-of-state horse every other year. And one of Louisiana's own is racing with the cream of the crop this year. Uh, give me a minute is running in Louisiana Derby, and, and he's run in grade one company uh, in other states, and he's been a very nice horse. And hopefully that he does well in Louisiana Derby. Give Me a Minute is by, fathered by, the most famous living Louisiana horse, Star Guitar. He lives at Clear Creek Stud, and the bar at the fairgrounds is named after him. Our final term sounds bad, but is actually pretty exciting. Breaking a maiden. Winning your first race and you're a maiden until you win that first race, no matter how old you are. Just as racing season is getting geared up with qualifying events that earn horses points on the road to the Kentucky Derby, breeders are in their busy season as well. We've got 65 foals on the ground at this point. We have about 65 more to go. And during the same period that you're full, and you're also breeding mares to get them back in full. Breeders are looking for the magic combination of speed and stamina. There's what they call speed horses. Generally, uh, they're considered ones that six furlong sprinters like. And then there's horses that are uh, distance horses that they're going to run a, at least a mile or uh, preferably the classic distances like, like the Derby and such. 
of a mile and a quarter or better. And utopia is, is to have the one with speed that'll carry it those, those distances, but that's, that's not easy to find. Harang, Early, and Morell agree they're all in the business because they have a passion for the animals. The best way to understand that feeling if you're new to horses? A good way to do that, I think, is to go to the races. Now, unfortunately, none of the Louisiana horses, jockeys, or trainers made headlines in the Triple Crown races this year, but you know what they say, there's always next time. There sure is. Kelly, thanks so much for that. Appreciate it. You know, we have stopped in at the West Baton Rouge Museum a couple of times this year for lessons in our regional history. Jeremiah Aries, a local photographer, taught us, Kelly, that Louisiana cowboys look a bit different from those more ingrained in mainstream American culture. Yes, Aries photos capture a common pastime found in Southwest Louisiana, the trail ride. Trail rides are a celebration of family and fun, all set to the backdrop of Zydeco music, often with live bands. Let's take a look. I was on my motorcycle on Highway 77, and it's a small two-lane road that sort of follows the bayou. And I was out there on a Sunday afternoon, and coming down the road were probably 50 or 60 people on horseback. I happened to have the camera with me. A gentleman named Henry, who was at the end of the ride and uh, was a flagman, sort of uh, keeping everybody in check, saw me with my camera and uh, he waved me over, encouraging me to, to join them. And so I had turned around my motorcycle and uh, rode with them, made some photographs. I asked if it would be possible for me to join them on another ride and they said yes. Initially, you know, I didn't know that uh, it would be something that uh, I would end up pursuing for four and a half years. And the more, the more time that I spent with them, I realized there was so much here. Family was such a big part of the event that uh, people would bring their, uh, their wives, their children, and I saw uh, kids learning how to ride horses from a very young age. It's really a celebration. I mean, it, it's, it's, such a, it's such a fun activity to be a part of. There's music, there's food, there's just such a joyous atmosphere. One of the reasons I was so compelled to make the work is that I have, once I became interested in it, I found that there was so little out there in the world that told me anything about this culture that I was seeing. The origins of the trail rides are really an outgrowth of the equestrian culture that has been a part of Southwest Louisiana for, for centuries. Seeing somebody on a horse, it's, it's, it's kind of the mythic American figure, and usually we associate that with uh, uh, Westerns, and you know they're riding, maybe going against the sunset, and they're white. I mean, that's what people have grown up to think of as, as, as the cowboy culture. Here we are in this very unique place in Southwest Louisiana. I like to be able to expand that view to encompass uh, a broader segment of the population and yet at the same time realize that these trail riders are a part of this original equestrian culture that uh, you know a, at least a quarter if not more of those uh, original cowboys were people of color and here's a real continuation of that history being enacted on the streets of Louisiana every week. A big part of it for me is trying to s compose within the frame of the camera um, a manner in which is going to describe as much, of po as much as possible about the world that I'm witnessing. So just in order to do that technically, I'm often using a wide-angle lens, which enables me to get both close to the action and yet reveal a lot of information on the periphery. For example, this photograph behind me, I'm on a trailer with them. I love that there's, uh, you know, again, the sort of multi-generational uh, representation here of the kids. There's a young, uh, a young girl uh, with a lasso in hand. Riding just behind the trailer on horseback is a gentleman uh, uh, who is embracing a young boy on the saddle, teaching him to ride. And so you see him in the background. And you know the wide-angle lens that enables me to be close, kind of intimate with the subject, and yet still reveal a lot of external information about the world. Um, with the photographs, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, looking for moments that might be both intimate and at the same time descriptive of the larger scene that is unfolding. 
but I'm also trying to capture uh, uh, the landscape in a way that can describe this place. And so many of the photographs are um, really descriptive of the kind of uh, uh, landscape of Southwest Louisiana. We see sugarcane fields, we see water, we see um, uh, you know, the bayou. The rides happen on a weekly basis, and so you know, I try to send everybody a digital file of the photographs in the week following the ride. And then the next time I am able to attend a ride, I'll bring eight by 10 photographs and I'll look for the people that I've photographed in the previous, uh, in the previous years. I think it's really important the, the uh, people have uh, representation and representation of themselves and in a way that signifies uh, power and respect. And for me, I hope that the photographs convey that. I, I feel that they do. And I think that there's a point of recognition when I'm able to share that with the um, subjects. You can see more of Aries' work in a new book called Louisiana Trail Riders, scheduled to be released soon by UL Press. Kelly, thanks so much for that. This week we celebrated America's independence, so we hope you had a great 4th of July. That is our show, everyone. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows and other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting, with support from viewers like you.